Hello, good morning. Welcome to the first talk today. Um, I'm very, very honoured um, to count on these amazing guests today. Um, of course, invited by Klaus Speidel, who's going to moderate the talk today about the relationship between the potential relationships or, not, or lack thereof, we'll see, between drawing and AI and technology in general. I will let Klaus introduce, you'll introduce your guests, of course. Um, just want to welcome you and to ask you to pay attention to your phone, so put them on silent mode, turn them off if needed, please, because um, it interferes with the cameras. Um, and also to let you know that if you really enjoy this talk, don't forget that it will be on our YouTube channel, so tell your friends. And while you're cooking, maybe you can listen to it again. Um, so without further ado, thank you very, very much, Klaus. Thank you for being here, all of you. and. Um, Enjoy the talk, and please don't make any noise. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you so much for inviting us um, to have this talk here. Thank you to our guests. Um, I do it by alphabetical order. Gregory Chatonsky, who's uh, an artist uh, and researcher now based in Paris. He always says, now everybody claims to be a researcher in art, but he did a PhD in philosophy, and when I hear his talks, I'm like, okay, this is uh, research even in the academic sense, uh, not yeah, only in the artistic sense, which uh, is interesting research, but non-academic, I would say. I mean, it's another difference, another talk. Uh, Mali Svirt, who is a curator at the MAC, is uh, responsible of the digital collection and of the design collection. That's a, um, a new post that has been created two years ago, is that correct? Yes. Three, uh, 2016 already, 2016. And Rita Vitorelli, who's a, an artist and is the editor-in-chief of Spike Art Magazine, which is also important because it really intersects with her artistic practice, um, working on, on the different editions of Spike. Well, today we're, the talk was basically the technology and drawing talk and we decided to focus it a little bit more on AI, but there's also quite a bit on drawing with digital means. Um, and without much further ado, I have a short introduction to kind of get us up to speed, as they nicely say in English, and then uh, we have some, some slides on your work and a discussion on the different topics on your work and your thoughts on the questions of how does technology influence drawing, how, uh, how does AI influence drawing, maybe also some attempts to predict what it will do to which kind of drawing. Um, yeah, I, I asked uh, whatever, uh, what all people do, I asked JetGPT in this case for um, as you can see, a conceptual mind map on the relations between drawing and AI. As you maybe know, ChatGPT now also has an interface to Open Dali. And when you enter a prompt into ChatGPT, it generates a prompt for Open Dali, which you can then ask ChatGPT for. So there's a hidden prompt that's in between your prompt and, and Open Dali. And that's what, uh, what uh, was generated. You can see that the words are still not there, but you have automation, inspiration, creation, and uh, learning and ethics. So these are supposed to be the different zones of importance of this intersection between, you know, draw drafts people and um, and artificial intelligence. Well, starting with the idea of of drawing after digital. I did an exhibition uh, of this name in 2015 and was trying to classify uh, different ways in which the intersection exists. So a first way I would say is that digital practices work as a motive for drawing. That's basically reflecting the digital world. When you're an artist, you look into the world and you're like, okay, now there are a lot of people you know, sitting on the computers, some, some of them uh, on, on sex webcams. This is a series of Thomas Levilan, a webcam series where he's always interested in the weird moments, the moment where nothing happens, where it's awkward, um, this, the moments in between the sexiness. Um, or this is another series where he drew friends during the pandemic, so it's a portraiture at the age of you know, digital technologies where we connect it from a distance. Um, or this work by Vincent Broquer, 
very beautiful drawing and then a pop-up that he drew on the drawing, you know, suppress the image, yes, no. So this is um, one, I would say, more basic relationship where, okay, now we live in a world with a lot of digital stuff. It becomes a motive for the works we, we make. A second uh, way to, to work it, it, with it is to appropriate digital forms in drawing. Um, for instance, here again, uh, work by, by Vincent Broquet, where you see a, a wall drawing from the Drawing After Digital exhibition where the wall kind of falls down and you see the grid behind, which for those who have worked with Adobe tools used to be the, the grid in behind. So as if there was in the real world also a kind of grid of a generated image and this wall was a simulated wall behind which you could find the matrix or something. Um, or, uh, or in this case, heat maps by Julien Prévieux uh, in this work, specifically heat maps that are generated to detect crime, predict crime, but that were drawn by hand by policemen. So normally this is generated by digital technology through data, but here it becomes something that then is redrawn by an artist and here uh, with a different technique, airbrushing technique, again a heat map that has been drawn by hand based on data. So here you have basically forms that we know from the digital realm that suddenly are injected into drawing practices. We have a few uh, works of, of this kind here as well. Well, the third, and that's where we come closer to also our, um, uh, the, uh, the people who are present with me on the podium, is using a computer as a tool to draw. Claude Kloski is here today, uh, and this is one of, of his series where he worked, uh, they're called Composition for Photo, Sorry, there's some the accents didn't get right, but compositions for photo where he used the computer to basically make drawings with this paradoxical idea that you compose it for a photograph um, using the di digital technology. And of course, we have pioneers of digital uh, art um, who use that technique. That's one, one detail of the composition of photos. And we have pioneers like Vera Mulna, who's now rediscovered or discovered really now that people care so much about the digital. You know, people like Molnar or also Manfred Mohr uh, become prominent and come to the fore as early people working with computers. Manfred Mohr used to work in the computers of the Meteorological Institute in Paris at night when the engineers were gone. He says it was the happiest years of his life to go there and have the computers to do his drawing. So this is really the computer as a tool to generate drawings. And this is already a preview a little bit of Rita's work from Skiz.io, which uh, is a digital drawing tool, mm, a program by Ham van den Dorpel. We will speak a bit more in detail after it. But this is also digital as a tool where you start to draw with a computer or an iPad, and it becomes a kind of extension or a new kind of canvas. A fourth, which maybe is less present in most people's mind, is drawing with the social web to be like, okay, the internet is not just an internet of individuals, it's a social internet, the web 2.0 famously is the social web, um, where artists have invited other people to contribute drawings. This is a series by Clément Valla called Seed Drawings, where he starts with one seed and then pays click workers to reproduce the drawing and then other people to reproduce the drawing that has been reproduced. So you see one seed and how this drawing evolves as different people try to less, more or less faithfully reproduce this drawing. Um, this has also become available really in the digital realm. Um, there were, of course, you know, uh, uh, techniques of reproduction before, but it has become much more massive, as you can tell with this large canvas. Well, uh, coming again closer to our uh, the people present here is where AI really comes in, teaching a computer to create drawings. Here again, to open up the space and, and show you that what we're talking about is not just us, um, but there's really a space around it, and different people have worked in this way. Claire Malrieux, uh, Atlas du Temps Présent, these are drawings based on scientists' drawings generated then by um, a, a learning, uh, an AI network, basically. So uh, these are some of the inputs, for instance, from different scientists, and these are then outputs that are generated. And here again, Gregora, uh, Gregory Shatonsky, uh, <laughs> Gregora, Gregor, Gregory Shatonsky uh, becomes salient with his work Deep from 2016 where he tried to teach a machine to draw based on his own drawings but realized that there were too little 
which is obvious, you know, how much data is needed to feed these AI engines. So you needed to use drawing manuals as well, to feed the drawing manuals and your own drawings. And then the machine generated these kind of abstract, uh, interesting, somewhat weird drawings um, in the series Deep. And um, last but not least, I have uh, here point six, is emulating an AI that creates a drawing. Oops, you see the preview. And let's see. Back to, unfortunately, the plugin connection. It's not the, yeah, fails. Um, and this is the dislocation series that we'll look at a little closer where he asked an AI, and you can tell us a bit more in a, in a second, to generate architectural, broken architectures, and you drew them afterwards by hand. Yeah, lastly, for this intro, there's the, there's the question of how AI really interfaces with reality. If we think that artists, even with Baudelaire, you know, uh, l'art c'est un coin de l'univers vu à travers un tempérament, a lot of people don't believe in that anymore. A lot of people still do, I think, believe. Maybe that's even the major, the majority view still of art is that, you know, an artist shows how they see the world. And Baudelaire said, uh, art is a corner of the universe as seen through temperament. Well, artists refer to the world, one could ask, how is the worldview of these AI models? And there are different points of view, and this is one radical one by Hito Steil, where she says these renderings don't relate to reality. They re relate simply to the totality of crap online. That's their field of reference. Just scrape everything online and that's your new reality. And that's the field of reference for these statistical renderings. She refuses to call them images even. She doesn't not only not call them drawings or photographs, which I find is correct, but she doesn't even call them images, just statistical renderings. But when you listen to some of the people who make this stuff, Researcher Ilya Sutskever is the head of research at OpenAI, says the following about this question. As our general people have become extraordinarily good, they will have, I would claim, a shocking degree of understanding, a shocking degree of understanding of the world and many of its subtleties. But it's not just the world, it is the world as seen through the lens of text. It tries to learn more and more about the world through a projection of the world on the space of text as expressed by human beings on the internet. But still, this text already expresses the world. Okay, so his point of view is basically, sure, we use the internet to feed the models, but the internet was fed by people who have a relationship to the world, therefore our models have a relationship of the world and potentially an understanding of the world. He goes much deeper in, into this argument, in this talk, but that's is basically the opposed point of view to Hito Steyl's, right? It doesn't stop at the internet, it doesn't stop with the text. There is a relationship to the world because this text was made by human beings for now. Um, well, now, um, after this kind of mise en bouche a little bit, or this, this first intro with some of the controversies, I would like to move to the presentation of the, the practices and why, why all of you uh, are here today uh, and how your relationship was to these different technologies, to, to the digital, but also to, to AI. Um, Gregory, uh, you said you would like to, to yeah. comment quickly on, on each of these series. You have to unmute. Yeah, uh, so uh, sorry for my terrible French accent. So um, it's difficult because uh, there's a lot of topics. So maybe I can begin with uh, this question of reality and the world, maybe. Because with this technology, it's not digital. It's not uh, the same area than computer-generated uh, pictures. It's something else. It's like a child, and you have to learn uh, from data because during more than 20 years, we all feed the web like crazy people. Uh, and we give all um, a lot of memory, life memory. And we don't know why, because when we put on the web uh, all the memory of life memory, we, we don't even have the time to, to, to look at the trace. So we just put on the web, and we don't understand why. And now we understand it's to feed the machine to create a new kind of memory. So what is this memory? In fact, 
uh, for me there's uh, four memories. The first one is uh, to take uh, an example, it's just a, a note of music. So you listen, uh, just one note, and it's the present. The second memory is two, three, four notes of, of music. And so y you have the comparison between the different notes of music, and you create a melody in your, in your head. The third memory is, of course, uh, the hard drive, uh, a vinyl, you can hear the music again and again and again. And now we create a fourth, uh, uh, the fourth memory. So it's, it's not uh, pictures, it's not image, it's image of image, text of text. So it's a recursive cultural tool, in fact. And it's uh, when, uh, you so you don't create anything, you just work on, on the culture, on all the data on the web. In fact, so this work was a disaster. In fact, because uh, it's like it's just the style of drawing, <laughs> but it's not a drawing; it's just abstraction. So it was in uh, 2016, I think. Yeah. So I began to use this kind of uh, software uh, uh, m uh, 15 years ago, and so the the, the um, this software was like uh, a child. Uh, and it just mimic, mimics the drawing, the style of drawing, like a style transfer. So it was just like uh, a child, uh, like something like a, 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 a mimesis, but with no representation, just mimesis of drawing. That's it. So yeah, uh, this work was not in. The, but I want to show this work was not with artificial intelligence. It's, it's, it's more deductive, it's not inductive work, it's more deductive, but uh, it's a good uh, matrix, to, matrix to, to understand the way I work. Uh, so it was a generative, um, destructive uh, map of archi architect. So a destruction of uh, ar architectural uh, destruction. And I create a prothesis on a plotter. So you know the plotter, it's like it's to draw like a printer. And I put my hand on it. And I draw with my hand, in fact. And it's take two hours, so uh, I was really tired by that. And I, I feel really, so what I look for in the machine is, uh, is to be alienated, in fact. To, to, to really, not to control the machine, but to, to be in alienation, in fact, and to see what the machine can do to me. Where did the motives come from? Like, uh, how oh did you ca get to a destroyed? Yeah, it was a three D, three D models uh, and a, a software in three D Max of destruction. So it's create again and again uh, a lot of destruction in isometric view. So like like a, an architect map. Uh, this one is another example. So. Uh, I, I draw this one <laughs> with it's take a lot of time. Uh, so it was really simple. Uh, the machine uh, create this uh, cellular picture. And I just, uh, I just do it by hand. And I copy what the machine, what is on the screen. And after, I destruct the file, the origin file. So it's, it's, um, it's always this question of alienation, in fact, to experiment the alienation uh, by the machine. Yeah, and, uh, another... A few uh, more examples yeah. from the series. And then this is second series. Yeah, it's uh, the original. Uh, ah, okay. But I don't draw this one. This is not drawn. Yeah, yeah. so... Um, this is printed. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but so these are basically uh, AIs that have been fed with cells. Yeah, correct? with cell uh, images, scientific, uh, scientific, uh, scientific images and also old 19th century images. And it's create another project because it's just a little part of, of my work. It, it, it's create a generative video about uh, artificial uh, natural science, in fact. So it's create another history or counterfactual history of, uh, of the life in, on another planet. Ah. May I ask something? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> are you creating these softwares on your own or are you using software and... In fact, I, I, I use, uh, I use uh, standard software, but I record it and I do my own fine tuning, but I, I'm, I really use, uh, like now I use table diffusion, really. So I don't use um, web-based uh, software, 
But when we talk about OpenAI, I, I, was, uh, I was in the, in the beta tester of <laughs> Dali, and it was really funny because maybe you, you were on it, and, and you <laughs> before it was open for everybody, and we have a, a, a meeting with San Francisco people who say, you, it's forbidden to, to, to do uh, 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 political uh, images, to uh, make a human face, nudity. So it was really iconoclast, in fact. Mm -hmm. And it was funny to see OpenAI absolutely uh, obsessed by, uh, by this iconoclasm and uh, this rules. Mm -hmm. It was funny uh, at the starting point. I, I, there were, uh, for reality, they were very afraid by the fact that you can generate a face of somebody and these people exist mm -hmm. and, uh, and try and, uh, and make uh, something on, uh, yeah. Thank you for this short, uh, first short uh, round on, on your work. We'll come back to it in the discussion. Um, Rita Vitorelli, um, you will see it's by alphabetical order. <laughs> Rita Vitorelli has had a, a manual drawing practice, which comes from automatic drawing for a long time, and at one point moved to digital drawing. Can you already tell us a little bit about this, this move and, and how, you, how you came to, to use, uh, is it an iPad that you draw on? or? or a, a tablet, graphic tablet. Um, I can also, yes. do you want me to go through the, through the images? Mm, or I, I, mean, I think it's, a, do you also have a, yeah. the one that is moving? Yes, because absolutely. I think it's, it's yeah. easier to understand what is going yeah, sure. on when you see the, mm -hmm. the, the software piece, because the, yeah. Okay, but I could start with, the, yes, you mentioned the automatic drawings. I actually started uh, to be, I was, interested in um, automatic processes in general. So it comes from a kind of performative painting practice that I had or that I still have. And, um, and then it turned into even more automatic processes when it comes to drawing, what, which means that either I looked at the motif and not at the uh, drawing, or I l didn't look at the motif, but just at the piece of paper to draw, so any kind of uh, automatic drawing um, versions that you could kind of, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, so then um, I started uh, with digital drawings and it gave me more freedom than with the paper, I have to say, because digital, the digital sphere has something very light and playful, so you don't have this heavy burden of first the traditional um, like painting or drawing, sculpturing has this huge tradition, um, and it's a heavy burden as well. So how could you bring something like this in a contemporary style or in a contemporary world, let's say? And with, a di the, digi with the digital drawings, it worked a bit better because you are free, it's, you're free of this burden. And, um, and then I did a lot of digital drawings. A friend of mine, Ham van den Dorpel, who is a programmer slash artist, um, he saw these drawings and he asked me, okay, let's, it's funny how you do it, and I've never seen it like that before, so let's do something together. Let's create a software that you, where I am the programmer and you, are the, you, you do drawings with it. So we developed together a drawing software. And when we did that, uh, um, in, the, in the start, we actually wanted to um, have, an, like, have an open soft, like um, with, on, and sell it at the App Store and have it like, available for everyone, which did not work out because Apple had a lot of restrictions and so on. Uh, so we developed this together and the special thing about it is if you, see what you see here is not an animated drawing, so it's not drawing that is then afterwards animated. It's, uh, it's a recording of the drawing process itself. So while you are drawing, this app um, captures everything. It captures time, um, it, it captures every movement of your hand and it kind of captures actually everything that you are doing. Um, we, it's very difficult to work with that, so it, it looks a bit easier than it is because you have to 
kind of start from learning drawing from scratch because it moves all the time. So, <laughs> so you have to, then when we started it, I said also to him, okay, we have to do something that it does not move all the time because you kind of never can create a, 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 um, like a motive out of that. So we have a tool now where you can also stop it while drawing. W you can see that there are parts that are moving and then there are also parts that are not moving. Um, so you can basically choose for each element yes. if you want it to keep e exactly. moving yes. or if you but want it to be a stable element yeah. in the image. But what is interesting about this tool is that it's very simple, like it's a simple setting or a simple setup and the drawing process itself m is the complicated thing. So the complexity is lying in the drawing and not in the software because what I never liked is working with Photoshop or all these tools that allow you so many things. Uh, that where you can choose so m like 1,000 filters, 1,000 different sizes of um, of your brush or of your pen or so, and I think this is a bit limiting for what you. Do. So it's the other way around. You have too many options, and this is why it's limiting you. Here you don't have so many options, and this is why it makes you so extremely free. Um, I, one point that's that's interesting in this context is the fact that you that you have the hand that draws even. Even though you might be able to generate something that maybe looks like this with an AI, I would say this is a drawing, even though it was made with digital technologies, when you generate it with AI, it's not a drawing. It's a, an image in the style of a drawing. Like a photograph, there is no AI photography because photography is a process that has a certain relationship to reality, which is a trace-based rela relationship. Uh, you can have images in the style of photographs, but an image in the style of a drawing is exactly the same, would you agree with that, as an image in the style of a photograph? Just that in our cultural memory, it activates another box, so to speak. It activates the box of a person that did that by hand with a gesture. But there is no gesture. You could also say there is no draw, right? Um, and, uh, and in that sense, this is fundamentally different, even though the output may look dif uh, dis similar, it's fundamentally different, yeah. And I think it's also important to add that the artist's hand is, is, is uh, very present here. So it brings also back um, to a digital images or digital artworks sometimes are very, like they look very clean or mechanical or in a, they have a different like they have this typical digital style and here we were interested in doing something that brings like the artist's hand back to this digital world um, and even now I mean we we started this years ago so by the way this work here was also one of the first NFTs ever minted because when we had these files we uh, did not really know what to do with it so <laughs> so um, uh, Harm said, okay, let's just um, store it, like put it on a blockchain. And this is how, why we did it without thinking too much about it. And the idea was uh, that we, so we had a, is, this is an addition, and the addition is big, so it's 100 pieces, but it started with $10. And an algorithm increased the price. So the higher, like the addition 100 was I think 500 euros or so. So we had this increase of, but no one wanted to buy it anyway in the, in the beginning. <laughs> so we sold a few of these 10, 15 dollars or so. But when this NFT hype started two years ago, or when was it, a year ago or so, um, this um, was, as it was one of the first NFTs, um, it got immediately sold and traded and so on, <laughs> which was very funny because we did not expect that and it was not our intention to, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I, 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 find, I think the point that you're making is really interesting. That's why I had also included, the, it was very recent when I had done the drawing of the digital show, I had included it because it has a deep relationship to drawing yes. to the performative element that a lot of people are interested in because you still have the trace of the maker and you have it in a certain sense, not only as a trace that's fixed, but you have the gesture repeated and repeated over and over again as if you were basically behind the image like when Picasso was filmed and you saw his gestures, you're behind the screen somehow. Your hand is still virtually behind the screen, so I think it's quite interesting in, in, in that sense, yeah. Um, well, now to something 
completely different or not completely different your relationship to uh, to drawing spike as also the editor in chief of the magazine you do the covers you do editorials with drawing are these all digital drawings as well or yes these are all digital drawings so spike is um, i founded it 20 years ago actually this year it's 20 years old and um and it's I mean, I founded this as an artist and I'm still doing um, an art magazine as an artist, which is very different in doing an art magazine as a journalist, art historian, or um, with a, someone with a business background, let's say. So um, it's not, technically it's not an artwork, but it's close to, to I don't know the English word for this, like it has a work character. How could you? Yeah, it's, a, it's like a work. It's, it's like, like a work, work, but it's not a work at the same time. So it turned more and more into... Um, something that, so I started to work with our graphic designer on the covers, so all covers are um, collaborative works. Uh, a lot of the covers recently are actually done with an AI, so it's three people now, the AI, Mirko Borsche and me, so the left one for example with, um, with these um, like the Skeleton. skeletons, it was a drawing that I found. I redraw it. I gave it to Mirko. He um, he reworked it with an AI. I did the um, logo, and so so it comes to like it's a, it's it's a collaborative artwork, I would say. Um, and the editorials are yeah digital drawings as well. And the editorials always like um, they react to what my editors are writing in the editorial. So it's yes. And you kind of change the style sometimes a little bit. This becomes more like a map and yes. you adapt the style to the contents. Yes, and they are in size always totally scalable. So they could also exist outside the, um, the magazine. Mm -hmm. And we did prints with it or uh, posters or yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's important for me that size when it, when it comes, because one interesting topic when it comes to digital artwork is how do you bring it out of the computer? Um, and how, because it looks of course really fancy and great when you have the light from behind, from the, from the screen, but uh, very um, often artworks when you see them then artists don't really know how, what to do when you, how, how to exhibit them. So they print it on a canvas or on a paper or something and then it does not look that great anymore. <laughs> uh, so what, are you, what should you do with the digital artwork? I think this is a very interesting topic. Um, is it a screen that you present, uh, but then we have uh, exhibition spaces full of screens or should it be projected on a wall or do we have completely soon new technologies hopefully? And there are also many ways of bringing it into 3D, but I will touch yes, on that. Yes, for so. yes, for example. So I think this is only a beginning. I mean, it's not even tested out what we can do with uh, works in a digital s digital sphere in general. I mean, immersive spaces, not te yeah, or maybe you just um, sooner or later you just have it somewhere in your glasses or whatever will, will happen. But these works are scalable and I think this is an important fact when it comes to digital work that they are so free. Yeah, I think it's an important point. I mean, when you said that you destroyed the file of the drawings you did, you know, that then becomes a conceptual gesture. And I think it's important to think about that when you do a digital drawing as an artwork, not just as an illustration, not just to have an image, but you think of it as an artwork is to think about what it implies to print. Very often one has the feeling, okay, it's an edition of five because the person needs to sell it and people want to put stuff on their walls and it has no conceptual necessity that it is a print and that it is an edition of a certain number. Um, so that for me artistically is not very interesting. I mean, the market needs this maybe, but, uh, but the collectors have also become more sophisticated or there's, uh, there is a collector base who prefers to have digital artifacts, to own digital artifacts in that sense. The NFT certainly was a sort of progress that people you know, recognize the possibility of owning a digital artifact. I think it's also conceptual progress. It's not just bragging rights and everything that we may critically think about NFTs, but yeah, it's a, a solution. One tiny remark to so the last one is uh, I was also interested and this is why I decided to um, because 
it's also a bit strange to have your own magazine and then you show your own artwork in your own magazine. <laughs> um, but w I was interested in not seeing, th how, how could you see it? Is it an artwork or is it not an artwork? This is why I was saying that it's it reacts also to the text because it's, it's, it's an artwork and at the same time it's not. So, the function so what is the function of this? Yeah? Is it, and this was, is it, it's not an illustration. It's actually applied it's arts in exactly, a way, right? It's applied so arts, yes. In a, in a contemporary sense. So this is why what I was also like testing these limits and testing what, what is a piece of art and what is not, uh, what does it make to, does it have to be printed out on a, on a canvas to make it a piece of art or not? Yeah. Well, this is a good transition to Marlies. Marlies jumped in. Marlies Wirt um, is curator at the MAC, which is the Museum for Applied Arts in Vienna. And, uh, and also made, I mean, I think the first time I heard of you when I moved to Vienna was when you had made the Mac acquire the first, it was the first museum to acquire work in Bitcoin, if I remember correctly, um, which was the screensaver by Han van den Doppel. So he comes back, he's an important figure as well for this digital world. Can you tell us a little bit about how that happened? Yeah, first of all, that's uh, the perfect connection here with Harm and also Rita, because I wanted to mention, like, I've known Rita and Spike magazine for a long time, obviously as a curator at the MAC, and this is uh, digital and uh, contemporary applied arts, what you're doing. So it's cover illustration, it's conceptual, it's never been meant to be printed on paper. And this brings us to this um, <coughs> project by Harm van den Dorp, it's called Event Listeners. It's um, uh, been created in 2015 as a screensaver for Mac OS systems. Um, here you see this exhibition view, which uh, Klaus mentioned. It was shown in the exhibition 24-7, The Human Condition, in 2015. That was about working and non-stop being online and being available in the digital age. And the screensaver is an antiquary thing, actually, because our screens no longer need saving. The screens are technologi technologically advanced, so the screen will not imprint uh, any any light uh, on it, so it doesn't need it. So it's an, a kind of, um, the, the artist obviously was aware of that. It's some kind of uh, antique medium, if you may. Um, and um, it is um, not specifically drawing in the definition of Klaus and Tito style because it's the image of drawing, but it's moving. I don't know if you have the video file. I oh, that would be great to play it just in the background. Oops. Because it's very um, interesting, it's running on my MacBook and it's um, surprisingly often you see stuff that you have never seen before because it's a generative drawing. It's a generative drawing based on so-called Lindenmeyer systems, which is something that occurs in nature. Um, m some of you might have heard of fractals, like um, patterns in nature that are surprisingly symmetrical or surprisingly... Um, yeah, seem constructed, but are random. And um, Harm, as we heard, he's a pro programmer and coder himself, programmed this uh, to be drawn. And it's overlaid by a text that um, reflects on his own um, thoughts on social anxiety and gathering on exhibition openings and in uh, yeah, public speaking events, um, where he, yeah, which is a very vulnerable, very personal text, which has the human touch counter positioned with this drawing that is made by a technological um, object or subject, as you might. Is the text also generative? Does it change? No, the text the is The text recurrent. is written like, uh, by the artist like a diary. Okay. It's always the same text, very, very personal, autobiographical, and the drawings ever-changing and oh, um, contrasting that. Okay, yeah, okay, amazing. Well, uh, is this already the... No, that's not yet the AI exhibition, right? Oh, there has been many AI yeah, exhibitions yeah, by now. Okay. So, so maybe just me, touching back on, bit, on yeah. your earlier question. So um, as you mentioned, we did acquire the screensaver and it was offered by two other artists that are very interesting from uh, Austria, Valentin Ruri and Andy Boot, um, who had a platform called Coin Temporary at the time, where they, it was really 2015, the early days of Bitcoin hype. And uh, in Vienna, we are always a little bit behind on that as well. So uh, they were offering artworks, not only born digital like this, but any artwork for the Bitcoin value of the week. And um, you could get lucky or not in buying that. And so um, we had a, we hosted a panel discussion together with Valentin Ham van den Dorpel and uh, the founder of the Bitcoin Bank in Graz back in the day uh, to speak about the idea of the digital image. Is it an object even? 
uh, does it exist, like the Hito style kind of argumentation. It was called uh, digital superposition. And in the course of that, Tom presented this brand new work, the screensaver. And after that, um, me, uh, as the, the head of the collection and our director both said, we should actually acquire this. This is amazing. This would be a new branch of our collection, the first born digital work that only exists digitally. It's never meant to be printed or shown otherwise, it just lives on a computer. And it is applied art because it's a screensaver, so it's also functional in a way and a conceptual work. So we did acquire it, uh, much to the dismay of our bookkeeping department. We had to do it with a wallet and with the whole process of the Bitcoin. And this is also when we started, like I'm a trained art historian, but through the Mac also grew into the design and applied arts world to create a term digital culture as an extension of my collection uh, realm, design and digital culture. Because the, um, the way the technologies such as AI or digitalization in general, all the new tools rendering, um, I also have a note on that uh, in the next uh, slide, um, uh, create our culture with us and change the way we perceive culture is so astonishing that um, that's why the term digital culture comes into play. And if we, yeah, we, we are on? seeing right now, I think that La Turbo Avedon, just on a short note, to render as a vocabulary means to uh, make exist, to make something become. And rendering is b basically the the way to create reality. So I would <laughs> hardly disagree on the notion that renderings are not creating reality because they are um, mostly used also in architecture to create real life looking renders, illusions of what your house and apartment could look like in the future. And um, La Turbo Avedon um, uses rendering and in this slide uh, we see their face in different ways as an avatar because La Turbo Avedon only is a digital person. Um, they, um, used, uh, they are non-binary, they live in computer games, on screens, and you never get in touch with the physical person. This person obviously exists, but it's kept uh, quiet, it's a persona. And uh, the drawing process here is done with software program, custom software, that is used also uh, for architecture purposes to be rendered. Okay. And there, there's a, a movie for children uh, in France, and the kind of main line of the movie is "C'est pas parce que c'est inventé que ça n'existe pas." Mm. It's not because that it has been invented doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. And I think it's a pretty deep thought, actually. Uh, it can still exist in people's minds very strongly. Absolutely. And, uh, in, in and also, case, the yeah. avatar is kind of existing, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and yeah, this is. Um, uh, the AI font, 500 different font types generated by uh, machine learning, Process Studio for Art and Design, Moritz Riesel and Martin Grödel, created it for the exhibition Uncanny Values, AI and You, which I curated together with the media theorist Paul Feigelfeld in 2019 for the MAC Vienna. And we showed um, artists uh, such as Trevor Paglen, Hilda Du Hegborg, um, Sam and Danny and others who were critically um, examining basically what AI and machine learning does, something that Gregory also mentioned, data is corrupted, we humans provide data so it must be uh, corrupted because machine learning will be based on our biases and on our mistakes that we have made in the past in judging people and places and um, historical events in the way we do. And um, this AI font was created to be used uh, for the, yeah, uh, the text. Yeah, uh, you can see it. it here, and yeah. also you can see maybe the emoji, like the little emojis um, that were also created by AI, but uh, maybe we don't have a picture. You can yeah, easily maybe. look it up if you're interested, AI emoji. Um, it's the way that AI imagined emojis to look like, and they all look they ha like they have been hit in the face or shot, like kind of creepy, but we still ended up using them on our posters in public space, and people still love them. They exist as stickers on Instagram also, just in case. Um, what are we looking at? I am. Now we do look at a very different part of a drawing, um, if you wish. It's animation, an animated drawing with animation software. And this is from our current show that has been recently reviewed in Spike magazine. Wang Ping, um, artist who lives in Hong Kong. And the show is called Edging. And as you can see, uh, he uses a very distinct uh, visual language, which is uh, very flat, rounded, cute, childlike, but the contents are more spicy than that. Um, but also these kind of references um, that he makes in kind of using uh, sexual language such as edging 
or also very literal uh, showings of, of genitals, is uh, to speak about larger um, societal topics and political topics. As I mentioned, he's living and working in Hong Kong, uh, which is a place that is between mainland China and um, the freedom that has been promised to Hong Kong. And there has been a lot of protests that we all heard of and know and the edging kind of title of the show also refers to that process of when do you give it all? When will it climax? Be it like the, the breakdown of society or political turmoil. Um, and he also uses uh, our own personal feelings of shame and thoughts of uh, we should have helped someone in public space, but we instead we looked away. Things that we do but don't like to talk about. He all uses that in his very intricate uh, stories. They're, they are short films with animated drawing. He does this drawing with the animation software that he appropriated for his process. Um, so he did not program this software in this case. And he always writes the story first and then he illustrates with more illustration than drawing, but still he also does yeah, draw by hand uh, in, his, in his works. Thank you so much for... I don't know if, if we have... <laughs> no, no. So I would, now it's, uh, we have 15 minutes more or less left. I wanted to show two more quotes and then open to discussion and um, yeah, for your questions, of course. First, a uh, kind of enthusiastic take by Mira Murati. She's a uh, uh, chief uh, technology officer of OpenAI, um, one of the prominent women who are in the AI field. As a lot of you know, it's, it's very male-dominated. And she was invited by Trevor Noah, and she speaks about it. And then we have, uh, we have someone else afterwards, uh, Guillermo del Toro's point of view on drawing and AI. And I think it's a good final question. It can assume, it can create, it can, it can inspire. Yes, it can inspire, and it makes this beautiful, sometimes touching, sometimes funny mm -hmm. images, and it's really just an extension of your imagination. There isn't even the canvas or the boundaries of uh, uh, paper are not there anymore. Okay, so it's just an extension of your imagination. There are no more boundaries. But of course, we are drawing now, so we want to know, can it draw? <laughs> And this is Guillermo del Toro on the topic. <laughs> it can interpolate information, but it cannot draw. It can never capture a feeling or a countenance or the, the softness of a, a human face, you know? So I, I, I think um, it's certainly if that conversation was being had about film, uh, it would hurt deeply and I would uh, think it uh, uh, as uh, Miyazaki says, an insult to life itself. Well, <laughs> so you have a very clear position. He's referring to a short video clip where Miyazaki was filmed. Someone presented him an AI-generated video of a character, and and he says, you know, this doesn't know anything about pain, and it's he would call it an insult to life itself. You can can find it online, and of course. The question here is not the ontological question that we already discussed, can it draw, is it a drawing in a kind of ontological sense, but it's really, can it capture something human? Can it, you know, ins yeah, so can it inspire, can it, you know, do touching images, or is it always going to be behind because it's not human? Well, is that, um, yeah, what, what's, what's your thought on the quality of the images that are generated? Like beyond this question of is it actually a drawing or just a generated image in the style of drawing? Um, yeah, just a few few ideas because it, it's quite complex. First, uh, I think that when you we see a generative uh, drawing, we we see the the style of drawing. So it's like the the mimesis, but without representation. So it's like autonomous mimesis. So we see ourselves, in fact. Second, uh, the question, can it draw? Can we draw? And we don't draw alone, in fact. We still have uh, techniques and so on. So the real question is what we do to uh, uh, artificial intelligence and what artificial intelligence do to us, in fact. So, uh, so it's, for me, it's always this question of uh, double alienation. 
because uh, all the questions we ask to uh, this technology, in fact, we have to ask to human. When, when you, you ask, can it draw? But can you draw? <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a really reflexive and cultural uh, a methodology, in fact. Thanks. Other thoughts? Yeah, I think um, apart from the question of drawing, which is the most prevalent on the drawing in our hardware, but um, the main question is like, um, can, what can AI do for us uh, in the terms of arts and culture? And um, I think it, it depends very much on what we use it for, what we want it to do. Because there has been a lot of so-called AI art out there that's just, uh, yeah, not my taste, I'm not going to insult anyone, but it's just like random images that draw from these huge databases of, uh, as Peter style put it, human crap that has been out there on the internet, or as I said, data of, of whatever exists already, what we already created. So it cannot be in this case, inventive or imaginative, but it can recombine data to something very crazy. And um, as recently, um, I think they, they got an Oscar for that set design, poor things, that movie, I don't know if any, some of you have seen it. Some of these landscapes and cities like Lisbon with the flying trains look like straight out of mid-journey. Um, so um, my thought is that the creators have been inspired by uh, this AI generated aesthetic because I think as for us as art historians or artists on this panel also and maybe the, the guest is also interesting what new styles are created right and what do we do with them because um, when we look at all these great museums here in, in, in Paris there are a lot of paintings and drawings in there that have non, not been particularly liked in the time they have been produced like what's, what's that style we don't like that it's modern style and then uh, now we have that and we have this little aesthetic cringe sometimes on these AI generated things but the question is how will it develop so I think I think it's a definitely interesting path to keep on, just distinguish, as also Gregory said, between can someone uh, use it properly or is, is it really art or is it just a um, playful thing, which is also okay to play with things. One thing, um, ha I don't know how many people here have ever tried to prompt to Dali or Mid Journey. I mean, have you ever tried this? Yeah. It's because can you raise your hands for those who have already tried out these tools? Okay. 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 Uh, About half yes, of you. because everyone who has ever tried this knows how difficult it is and that the results are really very bad. So it's uh, usually uh, nothing interesting comes out of that. Yeah? So maybe the more interesting point is, I mean, what is the act? L let's say as an artist, you try to create something with an image generator like Dali. Um, what, is the art, what is your artistic work? And I think it's the prompting. So I think to, 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 to find out what to ask and to find out how to work with this, this is the actual work of art in my, at the moment. Yeah? Because it's, a, it's, a still, it's still a very, very young tool. It's, um, it's, we don't know what we can do with it, we have no idea, maybe uh, in three months or three years or 30 years, no one knows, uh, it will, we, we would not even talk about this like it that. There's yeah. already a new it branch of jobs, Rita, so prompt engineers yeah, I know, who will help you, people who are not uh, but capable of yes, prompting. But, but this would be the next problematic uh, thing, because p Google, who is, who is doing all these things? It's all these big companies and these, co yeah, so they are kind of... Uh, 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 developing so much more than artists are able to develop because of money and 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 manpower and 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 time and energy and all this so so i'm not sure what role artists can really have in this whole environment um i'm sure that they that we will find out because uh, it's a new tool and artists always are interested in new tools and should be um but i think this is totally open for me so well, that's also a good transition for opening up. Are there questions, remarks for the, for the panel? Yes. Um, maybe you can use my mic. Thank you. Maybe it's a too futuristic question because I'm, uh, I'm really wondering, listening to you, what, what is the point of view of the history of art? Especially maybe it's a question for you, Marlies. Um, what kind of, you, you are working for an art museum, so somehow you are writing the history of, tom of tomorrow. Wh what kind of history are you telling in the museum? Is that the, the history of technology, history of, um, 
of, um, I don't know, uh, maybe it's related to what is your art work and where it's rooted. I'm really interested in into this question. Thank you for that wonderful question <laughs> on, on uh, Pierre Hoff of the MAC. So the, the museum has been founded in 1864 and has always been founded as a contemporary institution. And um, maybe you uh, are aware of that, it is divided into materials. So Gottfried Semper, the art historian, has divided this museum into a collection department that are based on material in general. So there is woodworks, textiles, glass ceramics, um, then there's um, uh, yeah, breakouts like the Asia collection and then the contemporary collections. And what we now do with having this add-on of collecting digital works, we only have a few, I also have to stress that, so the screensaver has been the first, it's not, we don't collect like any NFT that comes along, I just have to really stress that. But the, dig the digital, if you want, the born digital works are just another material. So it's a material that is now used. Um, also, the, the collection of woodworks and furniture collects chairs that have been made out of plastic in the 1960s because it's not wood, but it's a new material that came into play to create things that apply to our collection. So the digital came into play to create things that apply to our collection. That's why we collect them. And specifically, we chose on our, the term digital culture as the add-on for the collection. It's collection of design slash digital culture and not digital design, digital art, or anything of that kind, because it's not about that. It's about digital culture. So many of the works we exhibit in the specific thematic shows or we collect are maybe not even born digital, but they relate to the culture that has evolved around using technology and, uh, and through digitalization and automation. And that can be work that is m m very much physical. Um, one example that has not been in the slides is uh, Peter Jelic, an Austrian artist who does so-called data drawings by hand, but they are based on an iPhone measuring of the Wi-Fi upload, ping and download data, which is very p precise data, which he then translates into hand drawing, which is very much humanly imprecise and poetic as can be, and it's a literal translation of data into drawing, for example. That's also something um, that's interesting us. So in, in terms of, yeah, as the museum writing art history, we are very careful about what we collect. So as I said, not every other NFT that comes on the market will be part of a museum collection, at least not ours. And what we also do not do is try and take historic works, make them into NFTs. So that's also a no-go for us. Um, and instead, as I tried to stress, uh, looking at the digital culture, and the practice of artists and how it evolves when they get these other tools, um, apart from the brush, the pencil, the saw. So now there's these programs, also very interesting, obviously, what uh, the practice of Rita and Harm with developing these kinds of software. So this is something that's, that's for the museum and for the art historian discourse around it, super, super interesting. Uh, and the next step, I hope this answered your question. Yeah, maybe one or two more questions. Yes. So I'm also working with uh, AI memory, and uh, it's to make my like uh, substitution of uh, myself, like uh, AI model of uh, myself. So like uh, when you are working with uh, AI, like do you think is it becoming uh, you? Like you are train training a lot, so is it becoming a disciple or like because you are working with them like whole day, <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, can you... Uh, how, how does it become you when you work with it? How does it oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, for, 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 for me, uh, for me, but just, just one answer for you and after, just uh, by the side, I, I think one of the biggest impact of this technology, uh, and I don't talk about digital, but really dedu inductive statistics, is it changed history itself. The way we construct history for us historian, because for historian of the future, there's too, too much ar archive. So we have to navigate. And uh, if you, we talk about data, and it's a way to answer to you, uh, we have a million and million of data. And when you work with a checkpoint uh, for artificial intelligence, 
you have millions of pictures and it's become a, a six tera, a gigabyte of data, uh, so, uh, six terabyte of data. So it's a, it's a way to, to reduce the number of data and it's a way to navigate in a new history because with documents of the past, you can make a resurrection of the past and, and create new version of the past, in fact. So it's a, it's a new history. And um, to answer to you, uh, it's a way to answer it's, uh, my experience for every day because I, like a lot of people, I, uh, I live in part of my life in, the, in, the, in this kind of software. It's uh, what I discover is it's to um, um, uh, navigate in uh, this latent space with this, uh, all the statistics because we have uh, in artificial intelligence no pictures but just uh, statistics and it's like uh, the reality of the possible, you know? So it's, uh, yeah, it's a strange experience of uh, ontology of the possible where you can put yourself, for, for example, a portrait and become somebody else and have another history. So it's a way to, um, yeah. And I'm not sure that the prompt is so important. <laughs> I'm not sure, but... Uh, because uh, this, uh, this value of language, it's uh, problematic. Um, is it okay if we take one more question or should I? Yeah, okay, it's okay, great. One more question. Hi, it's, it's not really a question, but I, w I wanted to, to react about this idea of prompt. You say it's not very important. And yeah, I'd like to just add some uh, perspective about this. Uh, when you work with uh, tools like Midjourney or Dali, the prompt is so far the only way of action you have. So in that sense, uh, yes, it's the only artist work you could do. Uh, but if you use stable diffusion like you do, uh, there's so much more to do about it. Uh, it's like you can train your own model. You can combine a lot of, uh, there are a lot of people amending existing models, creating uh, modification that tra they train with their own data set. So in some way you could even say it becomes uh, in some situation collective work, collective artistic work. Like, I, I mean, it's really, I mean, the idea of, uh, yeah, it's really big and it's really not just about the prompt. The, yeah, just wanted to add about this. Thank you for that. I can I can uh, uh, just add a little bit to that. The, the stable diffusion is a very good example because it's so different and actually not comparable to people using language prompts only. So it's, on the it's an on open the source model yeah. for those who don't know. Sta exactly. Stability AI is the open source version. Exactly. So it's also been used as a for uh, programming computer games and very complex. A world building, whereas the prompting that Rita referred to us in, in relation to her practice is really, and for me it's a very poetic thing, to rethink the wording we use, the language we use to describe things, because um, of course it's much more complex than that, but if you just say to something, I want uh, you to buy me flowers, can be any flowers, if you specify which kinds you would like, how large of a bouquet it should be, it will become much more graspable. And I think language is so important in any respect of society, but also specifically relating to talking about these kinds of practices. Thank you. Well, again, a great moment to pass on. We tried to find some language to talk about these practices today. I hope it was inspiring, an extension of your canvases, or, or you are convinced that it cannot draw now, uh, definitely. Whatever it is, I hope uh, you take something away from it. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for your inspiring thoughts and for the invitation to drawing now. <laughs>